All righty. Well, let's go ahead and get this uh, started. So uh, I want to wish a good afternoon to everyone on the East Coast and good morning to all of you on the West Coast. My name is Max Farrell. I am the CEO and co-founder of WorkHound. And I want to thank you all for attending today's webinar. Um, today, we're talking about how mergers uh, and acquisitions can cause confusion and, and sometimes chaos. Uh, we know from worker feedback that the most common concerns result in questions like, who are we as a company? Am I going to lose my job? Is the company closing? Is our business unhealthy? Um, so as you can see, communication challenges are one of the top factors that cause company synergies to be at risk during a, an M&A. Uh, and that often can result in turnover, both for the folks on the front line, as well as those in the, uh, the front office. Uh, so before we get started, I want to share that we'll reserve opportunity at the end of our conversation today to discuss your questions. If you have any uh, questions or comments in the meantime, please feel free to use the chat or Q&A feature in the menu bar below, and we'll make sure to cover those towards the end. Um, so I'm joined by some awesome guys today. I've invited Spencer Tenney, uh, the CEO of the Tenney Group, and Michael McClary, the CEO of Ascend Transport Group, to offer their insight into guiding the people part of the merger and acquisition process. Um, so I wanna go ahead and introduce them. First off with Michael, He's an accomplished executive with 30 years of experience in supply chain logistics, ground freight and courier services across the domestic U.S. and global markets. Michael has a proven record producing results in field operations, marketing, finance, M&A, strategy, and technology. Um, in Michael's role of uh, CEO of Ascend Transport Group, it's a non-asset and asset-based carrier consolidating truckload and brokerage businesses to provide alternatives that, provide, that balance current market dynamics. He held multiple positions at Amazon, including the president of Truckload Brokerage in North America. He was also the head of Truckload Sales, a team dedicated to selling Amazon's growing backhaul network. Lastly, Michael was the director of Middle Mile Technology and Business Intelligence, a team with four distinct business groups, data engineering, tool development, data science, and data analytics. In addition to his time at Amazon, Michael spent 17 years at UPS running international and domestic US functional business, before becoming the global head of strategy for international package and supply chain. Michael holds a bachelor's in economics from George Mason University, um, also uh, has an educational background from Harvard Business School and a master's of business administration from the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. Michael, thank you so much for being with us today. Hey, Max, I'm sorry you had to read that. <laughs> That's way too long. You just make it a couple of sentences, it'll make it easier for you. But no, 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 thank you for, for having me and, and Spencer, I look forward to uh, having this discussion with you. No worries whatsoever. Um, so I wanna go ahead and introduce Spencer as well. He's the uh, president and CEO of the Tenney Group, a mergers and acquisitions advisory firm dedicated to the transportation industry since 1973. The Tenney family has been serving the industry for three generations. Spencer's a graduate of the University of Texas in Austin. As a Razorback fan, I won't say too much about that. And uh, is uh, also the only certified mergers and acquisition advisor in North America that is dedicated exclusively to the transportation industry. Spencer and his team have closed hundreds of transportation business sales across the US. Tenney Group clients are companies in the trucking, logistics, passenger transportation industries, often with annual revenues of 20 million to 300 million. Spencer's articles have been published across the industry in Fleet Owner, Transport Topic, School Bus Fleet, and many other industry publications. And he's a sought after speaker at national and state industry trade shows, currently serving as the chair of the American Trucking Association's M&A Task Force. Spencer and his wife, Lauren, reside outside of Nashville in Franklin, Tennessee. He enjoys songwriting, as you can see from the guitars, and is actively involved in Hope Clinic, a faith-based organization that equips women, men, and families to make healthy choices regarding unplanned pregnancies, depression, and addictions. He is also the founder of Tuesdays with Tenney Group, a networking group designed to enrich relationships and business opportunities for historic downtown Franklin, Tennessee professionals. Spencer, thank you so much for being with us today. Good to be with you. So let's jump into the agenda. Um, today, we're going to talk about how M&A can create retention challenges, but also opportunities. And as we mentioned before, during this process, the workforce has questions. And so today we hope to uh, help identify where are those blind spots that can help a company better prepare. 
So we'll cover how to assess cultural differences between companies, how to blend services and talents, how to maintain consistency with benefits and contracts, and then lastly, how to build a cohesive and easy to understand identity. Um, so as far as what we've seen, this whole conversation was inspired by driver feedback. What we've witnessed is that when mergers or acquisitions occur, workers are often left out of the process. And what's been an all consuming process for many executive leaders for many months is now suddenly news to the workforce. So they leave comments that are completely valid, but often filled with rumors or misconceptions that I hope today's conversation helps companies get ahead of. For example, we can recall feedback from drivers that said something like, is our company going under? I heard it was sold. And as we know, the truth is, if a company was sold, it's also very possible that it's doing extremely well. But since that's not often the perception of the folks on the front line, education is all the more important. So in that scenario I previously mentioned, the company communicated with their drivers to let them know that the acquisition was a good thing and clarified the why and the how of how it happened. And when it comes to cultural differences, employees from two companies coming together experience unique cultural norms that might, be, uh, might result in differences once these two companies have combined. And uh, in, in our particular company at WorkHound, we have uh, one of our values shares that information breeds confidence and silence breeds fear. So we know we owe it to our team or you owe it to your team to be as tra transparent as we can be throughout a process of change. And so uh, Spencer and Michael, I believe you provided some of these insights from, from our conversation a, a few weeks ago. Um, and uh, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about the opportunities companies have to strengthen a culture following a, a merger. Um, uh, do one of, one of you want to uh, take first crack at that? Yeah, sure. sure. I, I, Spencer, either one of us, I'm, I'm okay either way. Yeah, you jump right. in there. I'll, I'll fill in the gaps, Michael. Okay, great. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, tell me where I'm wrong. Um, um, yeah, I think it, it, it really starts before um, the acquisition occurs. Um, you know, one thing that we do on our part, um, and I'm rewinding to a conversation I had with our, um, with our, uh, our president yesterday is that early on in, in our process, we'll go through, we, we look at a lot of opportunities and you know, discuss the strategic fit, but then more importantly, myself and our president and our head of people operations, I bring them into the mix and we, we talk about the business a little bit. You got to make sure that the culture fits with the current culture you're trying to build. You can't try to, you know, squeeze a circle into a square because uh, it just doesn't work that well or, or the other way around. Um, so then when you're on the front end, the before you actually get to that point of saying, yes, we're gonna get married and we're going to the altar, um, there's a lot of up, upfront work that, that occurs. Um, you know, post the um, acquisition, or in our case now, we're, we're going through a rebranding. Uh, I think it's about generating excitement, not, you know, the, the misconception is that someone's gonna lose a job or that, um, uh, the company was bought to be dismantled. And in most cases, I think in m and it's really about putting together multiple businesses where one plus one equals three, not where one plus one equals 1.5. Um, and so when you talk about that culture, especially if we're looking at driver um, drivers and what's important to drivers, you know, greater density means greater home time. And yeah, you know, the sharing the benefits of a growing business, better benefit or yeah, the benefits in terms of healthcare, um, you know, newer equipment, putting these companies together creates synergy and scale that benefits all of the people. So, you know, back to our tenants and, and you know, I talk with our CPO and you talk with anybody in our, in our company, it's about um, culture and people and culture and people, whether you're at the front end or you're on the back end, if you keep that at the forefront, you're going to create uh, value when you put companies together. But it's got to be thought about as you're looking at and, and working with Spencer on the investment banking side, having him know who we are and what we're looking for. Um, uh, I think that that really helps prevent issues downstream when you actually get to the altar because you, you already kind of got a sense is this company going to fit or is it is it a little bit outside of what we're trying to do 
No, that's that's great perspective, and uh, I, I really appreciate the the emphasis of culture on the front end because you know, it can have consequences on the back end if you don't do do the homework. Uh, Spencer, I'd love to get your take as well. You know, what are you seeing that uh, companies are doing to uh, de-risk um, culture challenges later on? Well, a, a couple things that I think that um, I think that employees of transportation logistics companies would be surprised to know how deeply owners think about the livelihood of their employees when they enter the process of, of, of being acquired or selling their, their business. Um, what ends up happening is, yes, maybe the, the initial motivation might be to retire or to change lifestyle or to secure financial security. I can't tell you how many deals that we've been a part of. And as we get about midway through, the number one emphasis is the owner saying, I'm trying to find, I mean, yes, I want to get paid, but I'm trying to find the next best home for my employees so that they have career advancement opportunities that I can no longer make available to them because I'm done putting risk on the table. I've kind of peaked. I need to find the home that will allow them to prosper in this next deal. And so that is the heart of it. Now, the execution of that is kind of counterintuitive. And this is where I think a lot of employees um, um, where there's a disconnect in order for the owner to go deliver on those goals, they kind of have to keep the employees in the dark because this is a very confidential process and it's very fragile. And so, um, it, it seems counterintuitive, counterintuitive, but in order to promote the interest of the employees, um, there's nothing that's certain about a deal. Uh, you know, Michael and I were just talking about this. I mean, you can get all the way up to the closing table and something happens um, the day before. It might be a, a global moratorium on acquisition financing and it's done. So like the, it's for those reasons that you can't talk about a sale openly with employees until it's done or until it's until it's absolutely sure. Because in doing that, all that's doing is disrupting the environment and destabilizing your current job. And so nobody wants that. So I, I think that in terms of preparing for it, number one is um, the intention is I'm going to find the right home. And then in order to do that, I have to make sure that I have a stabilized process so that I don't unintentionally negatively affect my employees on the way to the closing table. Now that's, uh, I think that's really profound and, and worth stating that uh, the, the, the leaders, the ownership is, is really thinking about how to create value for, for their people in, in this whole process. And uh, as we jump ahead um, to, to our, our next slide, one of the things that often gets, uh, gets talked about is this idea of um, downsizing, um, which really isn't the case. It's, uh, it's, it's not downsizing. It, to your point, Spencer, it's creating additional opportunities for people in ways that may have not been there. So I really appreciate that, uh, that reframing of, of how to think about it, because clarity is, is critical for everyone that's impacted by a company transition. Um, and uh, whether it's folks on, on the front lines, customers, um, and everyone is going to be impacted, even if they're not really, they're going to feel impacted because change has happened. Um, so I so certainly understand the catch-22 of wanting to leave, uh, be, be really thoughtful about how to communicate this, this message. But you know, really, it's, it's not always the worst. It's not downsizing. It can be a growth opportunity. Um, so I, uh, I think that that's a really great point. Um, so I, I do want to jump ahead to, um, you know, thinking about how do companies combine talent? So, you know, Spencer, from, from your standpoint, how can you leverage talent insights from the team you're, you're acquiring? Well, I think part of it just starts with an honest conversation with yourself about where you're strong and where you're not. And, and, and um, you know, what we find is that a lot of, I mean, one of the primary drivers, especially right now, I mean, the, 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 the trucking logistics industry has effectively become a technology industry. And so, you know, what, what we're, it's moving so fast. I think what we're seeing is you may have like a billion dollar company that has a variety of different divisions within that. And what we'll see is like, Hey, we're really strong here, but we're just, we're not good in this piece of our business. And so what they might do is to go out and acquire a company that has an elite management team to go to that next level because, you know, it's so sophisticated now. It's very difficult to home grow that talent to an elite level. And so I think what you see in, in some ways is that 
part of the the acquisition is it's it's not just about synergies. A lot of it's talent acquisition. You're trying to get that edge to get to the next level. And so that starts by understanding where you're strong, uh, where you're not as strong, and then and then using acquisitions as an instrument to fill those gaps. And then through the combination, um, it's kind of like the old um, Jim Collins, good to great, get the, getting the right people on the bus and then moving them to the correct spots. And you know what's been my experience is that when people are involved with great companies, um, it's an amazing thing from a career, not just to like for career advancement, to be at the table with the best of the best um, and, and doing tremendous things in this industry. And that's that's just an exciting thing for forever as a part of the acquisition process. That's one of the major um, benefits and uh, privileges to be a part of. And, and so, uh, Michael, I want to loop you in here as well, because I feel like in, in observing how you operate, you've done a, a combination. You've certainly been able to uh, uh, bring in great talent uh, in, into the Ascend company, uh, Ascend Transport Group, uh, but also you have great folks that are working in some of the operating companies that you all have uh, brought into the fold. Um, so how, how do you think about um, leveraging the talent insights from, from the team? Yeah, I, I th the key word here to me is insights. I mean, there's a quote that says the universe doesn't give you what you ask for with your thoughts. It gives you more with the thoughts of many. And, um, you know, so back to people, culture, and, and Spencer and I have talked about this, you know, not moving too quickly post an acquisition to make changes. Um, I think um, back to people, culture, Giving a sounding board and um, being open to new ideas and concepts. And, uh, you know, I think I push our people um, equally on, hey, sh tell me what you think, <laughs> you know, because my ideas aren't always right. And when you start getting disparate companies together and owners that have seen the movie uh, as many times as you, but a different version of the movie um, uh, allows you to leverage um, their talents. And then you, that's back to, you know, my one plus one equals three, um, you know, not downsizing, but I'm supersizing, not McDonald's style, but um, <laughs> you know, really, really just trying to, to create opportunity and growth, um, not only for the folks in the acquiring company, but, but the, the groups in total, um, both drivers and, and, and back office staff, but it's the insights that you gain um, by being open-minded and that's where you know back to your prior point and uh, you know just feeding off of what's what Spencer was saying making sure you can get that culture you know you can you can acquire the best most profitable company and if they don't see the things the same way that you're thinking about them or the rest of your people think about it you can destroy value <laughs> yeah. um, you know the, the the there's a book called culture eat strategy for breakfast and I've seen that happen but um you know, really acquiring the company for the culture, for the people, then leveraging the insights that they can provide you and the rest of the management team. So everyone's part of that process. And, and, and that's where you, you'll see great success. Yeah, I think that's really profound because uh, I, I think there is a fear when, when a change happens that uh, that change is going to be forced up, upon everyone. And I've seen it happen in organizations where leaders come in and and they have the iron fist and they say, this is how we're going to do something. And it's not well received because they didn't operate with empathy. They didn't gather input and factor in the, the aspects that made that team the strong in, in the ways that it was. So um, I really appreciate that of, you know, go a little slower, give people a sounding board um, and take those insights to, to make the best version of, of the organization. Um, I appreciate you both sharing on that. Yeah, no, I think it's back to listening. I mean, God gave us two of these and one of these for a reason. So, uh, you know, the more, the more, the more you can listen and get feedback. And, and, and I, I think investment bankers do a great job of helping in, in the process by building the bridge between the buyer and the seller, being that listening to both sides and then weighing what they know about the seller and then building the relationship with the buyer. Um, I know that's not the point of this slide, but I think it's for the for the for the uh, uh, audience out there. I think that's an important point. That... Yeah, that's yeah. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, 
you know, I think part of this, you know, we talk about listening. I mean, I, I think some of this is just a real practical matter. I mean, part of our job is to make sure that that, that there's a deal that takes place that uh, addresses each party's respective goals in a meaningful way. And so we're, we're, we're trying to do that. And in, in some ways, um, uh, you know, we're starting with that on a financial side, because, in, you know, in, in Michael's world, if we can't kind of check that box, then, you know, that we don't even get really further down the way. And yeah. so, um, so part of this is, and what we found is that we may have excellent performance and we may know who's responsible for it uh, in some ways or, or, or by department, but even like the people that are closest to it, some of it's so like the way that they perform and the excellence that they deliver, they don't even know how to articulate that. And so like, it's, mm. it's completely unrealistic to, even in a quick transition period to be able to extract that depth of experience and to understand how to scale that somewhere else. Mm. And so it's like, it's, it's kind of like if you've ever worked with, and this is like, I remember when I was a young um, professional, I started working with my dad and I was trying to get him to train me. Um, and he was like, I don't, I don't know how I do it. I just do it. And so, <laughs> and so, and I was like, that's not helpful. And I think, it, 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 and I think in, when it comes to MA, there's some of that as well. Like when you're dealing with, talent that they are um, really doing tremendous things in this industry, but you're not going to really be able to realistically extract that in a 90 day due diligence process or even in the 90 day yeah. integration process. And so I think part of it is bringing some humility to the table and being very practical about how we're going to extract this information and then scale so that the acquisition can ultimately be fully optimized. That's, that's a great point. Um, I, I do want to dig in a little bit to, uh, because I know we have some operations leaders in the, uh, the call today, as well as some HR leaders, um, and, and talk about, uh, benefits, um, because a company wide change, like, a, an M and a opportunity, uh, can be a great opportunity to figure out what matters to employees, uh, from both companies. One of the missteps that we often see is, uh, folks will make assumptions about what people want. And uh, we found that oftentimes that's out of simplicity uh, where companies will just choose the best benefits <laughs> option that's the easiest, but doesn't necessarily put employees first in a way that they feel like they were put first. Um, so in this, we, we recommend are asking the questions, do, uh, does everyone understand their current uh, benefits package? Do the, uh, the benefits packages that we're offering even work for our team's needs and desires and then also thinking about how do we communicate the changes in these benefits. Um, and so, Michael, um, to follow up on, on these points, what types of benefits questions uh, arise during a, a typical M&A activity and, and how can you usually address them? Um, so I'll, I'll rewind back to my, my prior career when we looked at integrations and tried to estimate the cost savings. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that was the wrong approach. I think that the, mm. you know, to focus on how do I get, uh, how do I make more money? Not how do I uh, take care of our people with better benefits at may, potentially the same cost um, because that'll ultimately help you grow. So if I'm looking at M&A, especially if we're the acquirer or, or the buyer, we typically look at businesses that are smaller than us and the, the benefits packages are not quite as attractive. And I, I would even argue that the, you know, our platform that we inherited, um, the benefits weren't the best because it was about cost savings. Um, and, and, you know, from my perspective, it's making investments in people and our drivers and taking care of them and finding ways to uh, do it cost effectively. Um, during the M&A process, um, just understanding if I think, you know, pre-integration, you really want to get a good handle of what benefits the two companies offer and are there any differences that would um, cause problems, um, if, you know, post an integration. I would say in, in our cases, we're improving the benefits. So it gives our HR team and um, our uh, recruiting team something to talk about. That, hey, this is, you know, it's back to the people worry about, are you downsizing? Are you going to 
are you laying off people or is the company in trouble why are we doing this to me it's it's creating that buzz around culture and and what we're what we're bringing to the table and here is here are the things that are going to re result in improvements um and um i think max or spence spencer you said it early on it's you know commuting communicating communicating often making sure you're crisp and clear on the message that you're delivering um, once the, uh, I mean, you got to have a plan way before you're making that announcement, a very orchestrated yeah. plan. You know, the, the, the co-owner and the leadership team are locking arms and we're moving forward and here are the great things for you. Benefits is, is definitely, you know, does my pay change? No. Does, do my benefits change? No, they improve. Um, and you, 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 you nip it in, uh, you, you take care of it up front rather than waiting for it to become a challenge or issue. Um, but to, and, back to the, if I'm thinking the way I think about it, it's not the, how much can I save and how can I improve the profitability of the company that we're acquiring? It's what can we do for the people? How can we improve the quality of benefits that they receive today at a fair price? And, uh, oh, and the last comment I'd make, it's um, you can't have companies you acquire with different offerings. You need equality. And it's super important that you think about that equality before, as you go through the M&A process. Um, because without equality, when, when you have inequality, then there's always someone over there got something better and I didn't get this <laughs> and I didn't get that. And you want to, you want to think about that as you're, going through your diligence process, which is, you know, back to the, you know, why, why you work with someone, you gotta, you gotta like dot your I's, cross your T's, templatize it, make sure you get, get everything out there. So. And, and so Michael, I, one, one quick follow-up because it, it sounds like in your past, you focused on how do we save money here? And at this point, your mindset seems to be, how do we take care of our people through this, uh, this moment? Uh, was there was there a uh, a moment in your career where there was a, a switch or what what led to that evolved thinking? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, I'll, you know, I don't want to uh, um, indict the guilty, but uh, <laughs> we had a a, a company, lar super large company that um, that we had acquired at one of my prior employers, and um, the culture was entirely different. I was working with this kind of old stodgy. Um, you know, wear a suit to work type of business. And the company we acquired was this young entrepreneur, you know, run and go as fast as you can and just grow the business. Don't worry about expense. And you put the two of those together and it's a culture clash. Um, you know, the, the young, younger culture didn't care about benefits and just cared about growth. The older culture said, hey, we've got these great benefits, but control your cost. And it just didn't go well. So, you know, mixing oil and water um, and seeing how we ruined that company um, oh, geez. really caused me as, you know, I started down this, this path to think long and hard. Um, you know, there's a, there's, a, uh, there's a book out there called The Three Things That Every CEO Should Know. And um, what it says is that 80% of the success of your job, and it re relates to M&A as well, is people and culture. The other 20% is around numbers. Um, and I, I like to think I know numbers, um, but I, I also like to think that with my collective management team and our leadership and working through things together back to the, you know, the prior prior point, um, you know, we're going to get people, people and culture right. Part of what keeps getting beaten into me is benefits really matter. And I think they do. You know, I think some of these drivers, they're staying with companies because they offer great benefits and we, we want to be that that carrier of choice. Um, um, Spencer, sorry, I may have taken too long there. <laughs> no, I, I appreciate the, the the perspective and sharing your your lived experience there, Michael. And so, Spencer, from from your standpoint, any any other thoughts around um, how to think about benefits um, during a during or immediately after a merger or acquisition? Well, I would say two things. I mean, I, I think that that directly um, affects the way that you evaluate culture just in the on the on the initial screen when you're looking at compensation and benefits you're i mean it's it's very difficult to make that type of switch because you know like you said you, you've got to have consistency because if if they don't you know 
uh, paid much higher and their benefits are much better and you acquire this business, well, then your existing operation is going to expect to go up. So you would have to evaluate the, the, the cost adjustment and how that would affect earnings moving forward. So it, it may just not work. So you're really looking for compatibility when it comes to all things compensation and benefits. Um, and, and even if they're not exactly, they should be in the, you know, the spirit of those should be moving in, the, in a similar direction. Otherwise, it's just not going to work. And the sooner that you can smoke that out, the better. But I would just say that I think there's a practical matter in, in, for those that are kind of in that role of, of management teams and leaders. Like, this is not something that's, it's not really practical or realistic to, to it's not like a huge driver. It's something that, that certainly influence, influences the deal. Um, and so I, I think the people that have integrated well um, around these issues, they they do two things. One, they they communicate clearly what is going to change. I mean, after these deals, people are very interested in one thing: what's in it for me? How does this affect me? My money, my health, my family, and as quickly as you can satisfy that. I mean, I think it's just number one. Nothing else matters in terms of those things in, until you address that. Then you don't really have any trust with whoever you're acquiring. So. Where's my money, my health, and those types of things? What are the adjustments? And then scheduling real time for them to be heard um, because, you know, there's clarification. There might be requests, um, um, uh, well, all kinds of different things. But if you're just honest, you're clear, and you provide real space for, for that new group to be heard, then you're going to be setting a foundation where trust can be built moving forward, and you're kind of setting the stage for a successful integration and, and overall acquisition. Awesome. I, I appreciate you uh, sharing that. So, um, you know, given some, some of this, what you're talking about is around identity. And um, so when, when you think about uh, this, this merger, this acquisition happening, um, the feedback that we get is, is what you're sharing, um, Spencer. It's um, who are we now? What does this mean for me? And, uh, and of course, the, the innovative employers are then asking, how can we clearly communicate our refresh vision so that we prevent this internal tension and potential turnover? Uh, so we, we do have a few recommendations for, for when you run into that. Um, first is to make sure employees get the chance to interact with new leadership. Uh, Michael, you had hinted at this earlier that um, making sure that the, the leadership teams are all in sync together and championing how great this is for, for individuals goes a really long way. Um, and uh, make sure that you're reinforcing the, um, the positively the questions and concerns that people share by communicating and responding as quickly as they arise. Uh, one of the questions that uh, often pops up in, in this uh, sort of transaction is asking which company brand will be adopted or is there a rebrand of a totally new name? Um, regardless of it, at the end of the day, give the people the swag of what it winds up being because uh, as you all shared earlier, getting buy-in is, is so uh, crucial for eliminating confusion. And uh, of course, finding ways to communicate or to uh, pay attention to the rumor mill is, uh, is really important. It's not fun and you'll probably hear some crazy things um, and uh, some, some nitty gritty grassroots type uh, insights, but addressing rumors before they arise is how you wind up controlling the message uh, through and, and after a uh, merger acquisition. Um, so, yeah, I'm curious, what else should companies be doing to ensure their identity is clear and understood across all employees? And, and Michael, I know this is familiar for, for you, so I would love to get your take on this first. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, one thing is you, you, you've got to have your circle of trust. So I feel with anyone on our leadership team, I can have any discussion <clears throat> And I feel very comfortable that, that they're going to keep it within our group until it's necessary and, and until there's time to, to share it with everybody else. Um, but we have a very, I'd say, pragmatic approach. Um, I think we, we've spent a lot of work on vision and mission. We're bringing our leadership team to, to work on values and trust and an offsite, which, you know, back to people culture is so important. Um, <clears throat> We've got a micro site that really explains who the company is um, and that does a good job of articulating not only the message, but we've got, you know, some good videos of the executive team talking about change and what it means, um, including having the, the 
prior if in in all not all cases do you have to rebrand i mean if the company's completely independent in a different sector um, but there's a strategic reason why you want to bring them on board you can keep them the same if they're part of you know expanding out your over the road division then maybe they become integrated and and rebranded um but uh, you know having the owner talk about the vision and what his plan is and you know if they're becoming part of the future um and and explaining that this isn't this is about honoring the the, the prior brand and and what what happens when you become part of the new the new brand um definitely personal visits that's not that's not a um um option it, it, it's a must have you've got to you know getting out there shaking people's hands telling them who you are showing that you're human um explaining the vision and mission and what this means for them personally um, and then relaying back to the micro site, hey, go, if you have any questions, we've got a whole FAQ section set up that tries, and we, we sit down and try and think about every single possible thing that um, uh, uh, someone would have a question about. Um, uh, and then having talking points back to the, to the management side, again, it depends on the, the acquisition. Um, I just think getting to know people, you know, showing, showing who you are, that, that, that's, that speaks volume. Love the point about swag. I think sometimes that's underestimated, but especially for drivers, they love uniforms, at least from what I've found. Um, you know, so giving them some some clean shirts and hats and, you know, just periodically thanking them, you know, th uh, thank a trucker, um, always super important. And any, any opportunity, you'll find me in most cases in any of our terminals, I'm out walking around talking with people rather than holding myself up in an office. At least I try to. Um, but if I get out and I encourage everyone um, and our president does a really good job of doing that, but, <clears throat> you know, getting out, shaking people's hands, saying hello, letting them know that you care, especially on the, the company that you're acquiring, just so important because that one, it makes you real too. It shows, it, it tells, you know, what should they be expecting? Um, and then, then, then there's no questions because the worst thing you can do is you, yeah. you acquire, you don't communicate. Um, it's up in the air. Your mind run is starting to come up with what? Is, oh my gosh, what's happening? <laughs> right. And then people start leaving. So yeah, it's. Uh, I, I do appreciate the, the the emphasis that just because the transaction's done, the work isn't done. The work is just getting started, and yeah, you, know, you, you get, have to build relationships. Spencer, from from your experience, what sort of things have you seen in in a successful integration uh, where? Um, companies were able to, to find a smooth transition to a, a new established identity. You know, as we were talking there, I was thinking about that. Um, if there's any uh, office fans uh, on, on here, there's that episode of the merger um, of where <laughs> they're putting the new office up on the table of all the new employees and uh, just a, an absolute disaster. <laughs> and uh, but, but, but kind of uh, related to what we're talking about, I, I think the, the people that have done this really well um, have got input well in advance from the owner. And tell me about the personalities of these people. What do they need in order to buy in? Uh, specifically, the leadership team, because you know, as the owner, as the leadership team goes, typically so will the rest of the folks. There it is. <laughs> so, so, um, so I, 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 and the other part of it is, I think if you pay special attention to, to, to um, doing right by the former owner, and because if that was someone that was admired, then if you treat that person, if they feel like they're handled respectfully, then that's going to buy some time for them to, um, you know, buy into what you're doing and develop some trust there. So I, I really, the, the, the takeaway I would say is, is just find out what do we need to do and learning from the leadership team. Um, how do we get buy-in from the company in a way that um, it's going to accelerate the, the success of this deal and authentically listen uh, because what, what's interesting is that, and I think this is even true. It might be probably true of my company, probably maybe true of your company, Michael, but is some of the people that are kind of in your either leadership team or even mid-level, those are your greatest brand ambassadors, people that understand your culture. They're the biggest cheerleaders for your culture. And if you can hear from those people about how to make it go, how to protect um, what's going on, it's tremendous um, value 
and, and to, to make sure that you don't um, have a misread post-transaction and start doing stuff that, that you don't need to be doing. Yeah, and I think that's that's a really good point. You got to build the tribe to to make this a reality. It can't just be one or two people saying this is what's happening. Everybody follow me because you may get that look of mm, I don't know about all that. So I, I yeah, think and that's and really and to point. add to that, it's it's about consistency. So you know, it's not just we launch and then we're done, or we you know, we integrate and everything's good and everyone goes back to their roles. It's consistently delivering the same message and showing that you're real and you're fol and following through with what you say. So important. Same things I tell my kids, you know, <laughs> just gotta do what you say you're gonna do. It's, it's, it's simple. Yeah, that's, that's true. Um, so Spencer, one of the things you'd mentioned is to, to authentically listen. And um, so as we see M&A activity increase in the supply chain, especially in, in transportation, we are seeing more trucking companies depend on a feedback loop to get a pulse on their people um, during or, or after one of these, uh, a change in, in status of a company. So given the majority of acquisitions are, are done often to strengthen the driving fleet, it's important to capture the sentiment of drivers and the entire workforce throughout the entire process um, while an M&A is happening, as well as when a deal is closed. And a big part of it's because we all have blind spots. So capturing feedback helps us surface the issues and questions we didn't even know were issues. Uh, and what we see is that the most innovative companies are using multiple data points during these sorts of moments, including uh, using feedback to guide decisions and their communication strategy. And uh, more and more companies are relying on closing the feedback loop to show their team they're listening, they're working to get better through this time of change. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so at, at this point, um, I uh, I do want to open it up for uh, uh, Q and A, not M and A, because we're talking about that. Um, so one of the uh, the first questions here is. Um, what are some of the, the common mistakes that uh, companies make when they're evaluating the culture of a company for acquisition? I would say they don't. I think, you know, there's, there's less emphasis on culture, more emphasis on strategic fit. Um, back to my point about culture, each strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in some cases, I, I know in my prior lives, I've looked at deals that don't really... That, that seem to make great strategic uh, fit, uh, sense from a, a fit perspective, but they just should never have been done or shouldn't be done. Um, so I, you know, it's just missing the culture element and the people element altogether. You know, treating people like numbers, not like people. Yeah, don't do that. Uh, Bad idea. <laughs> Spencer, any, uh, any thoughts on your side as far as missteps that uh, companies make? No, I... I mean, I would just echo what what we're just talking about. It's just they underestimate the degree of of how an incompatible culture is going to affect the the long term success of a deal uh, and the people involved in it. I, I think that's that's you know I can't you know I emphasize how owners think about when they're selling when they really start getting close and deep into the process they really start thinking about the the how and they. They use this terminology. This is not me saying this. I want the next home for my employees. And so when they look at it like that, um, that's how I know someone's serious about finding a cultural fit because it's not just about a, a career. Yeah. They, know they're, they know that they're people and they're trying to select the right buyer that's going to allow these people um, to grow in their careers and in their lives. And so I, I think in the absence of that, you get some mismatches. Um, and it can just be very disruptive um, for unnecessary reasons. Yeah, I, I would add to that. Um, one thing is um, thinking you know it all. So thinking that you've seen the movie so many times that you're, you mm -hmm. know better you know, what, what you should do with the acquiring company than you should. Um, the second thing, you know, one thing we've done that I, I believe will, will be more successful in the future, I'm not saying it's not right now, but we, we converted one of our presidents of, uh, of an acquired company to run our integration because, you know, he, he was a small business owner and it was with his family for 
decades and he's been through the process and the emotion and you know on some of these smaller transactions where you know got a got someone who, who's running a 150 truck fleet um you know it's it's their baby it's the, they oh, yeah. and and having someone that can kind of shepherd them along uh, i think goes a long way and and they they know that they know what the feelings are and what questions that i'm not able to answer so and the last thing is a great point so, Max, the last thing I would say is that um, in order to evaluate the culture, I think you kind of have to have um, multiple data points that you're mm-hmm. sourcing. Because if you're just coming from the owner, not that they're, you know, misrepresenting, it's just like it's the owner. Like it's very difficult to talk about your own business, like in a way that's going to be accurate. Um, and so, like, if you get far, far enough and you're getting really deep into due diligence, uh, there is an appropriate time to kind of bring in that leadership team or, or management team, have an operational calls. And when you're asking certain questions, open-ended questions, that's where we're finding that buyers are getting um, clarity on cultural fit because you're, you're really getting into the minds of the people that make the thing go and that are affected by it the most day-to-day. So if you can get some different data points and then, and, you know, like I said, and then you, you know, you're going to get as much as you can on the front end. And then at, you, you close and you're like, okay, here's the full picture. Um, and then that's where you start learning and continue the education and getting as much data points deep into the, um, the layers of the company. And so that way, you know what to do and what not to do um, to accentuate the best things about the culture and to make sure you're not bringing in some of the more toxic things that are not going to, you know, play a role in, in, the, in the situation moving forward. That's, that's, that's great addition there. Um, and so our, our next question may be our, our last one. Um, what advice would you give to retention leaders uh, following a, a merger and acquisition event and during the, the integration? Um, it, it's, it's everything that we've, we've talked about. Um, I would say one, be very intentional and thoughtful on your communication plan and always expect the unexpected. Try to put yourself in the other person's uh, position and and um, be ready and prepared. Um, so over-prepare, <laughs> over-prepare and, and uh, over-deliver where you can, um, uh, uh, but listen. And, and I, you know, Spencer mentioned it as well. I think you know, active listening is so important to uncovering challenges and addressing um, uh, potential issues that could arise from from M and A. I mean, I feel like we're kind of painting M and A with this bad, or you know, acquisitions with this bad connotation. Um, but it's actually it it can be really good. It's professionalizing businesses or helping professionalize businesses that need to take the next step and they just can't quite do it. So we're, we're providing a, and I say we collectively as, you know, Spencer, myself and sellers, we're, we're, we're providing a valuable service that creates greater opportunity for everyone. I mean, it helps the economy. It helps people grow. Mm -hmm. Um, And so from a retention person's perspective, you should be excited about this, embrace it, Learn what it means, uh, you know, like I said, over communicate, over prepare uh, and, you know, turn that that fear and anxiety upside down into excitement and energy. Um, and, and, you know, how, how do we collectively work together should be a, a positive on the retention side. Spencer, uh, how would you add to that as far as advice for retention leaders? Um. I think that whatever they can do to um, show empathy, um, just to, to recognize that um, it, it is okay to have some angst and that you're there with them. I think that's a, a big thing to, to, to help build some trust. Um, uh, you know, you mentioned this closing these communication loops. I mean, it's one thing to be heard, but then to have the, cl- the, the closing of the communication loop I think that's a, that's a key thing in terms of building trust right off the front of one of these integration things. And so um, if companies are already doing that um, times to it, 
And if you're not doing it, get serious about integrating something like this because um, people need to be heard and they need to see some action around what they're sharing. Even if it's just like, hey, I've done these things, um, that will what will do, um, you know, that will be a great value that you bring to yeah. the company uh, if, if you can go execute on that. Awesome. Um, so quick question that just came in here. Um, you all had spoke about how there's businesses that make strategic sense, but don't make cultural sense. So for the ones where they make business sense, but don't make cultural sense, how would you advise them? I think that's I'll, 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 I, I'll just, yeah, yeah for, for me, I just move on. Yeah. I mean, people tell I ask us, they ask us all the time, like, Hey, me and Johnny down the street, we're friendly competitors. We think let's merge our businesses and then go to the market because we'll get a better deal. And th their cultures are, could not be more different. And I, I just say, if you want to lose a lot of money and have a ton of problems, go do that. Um, so, so it, it just, it doesn't matter how much the financial sense is it's, it's, it's doomed for a bad situation if, if you're not aligned on the culture. It's, it's, it's succinctly as Mike, Michael said it, that's, that's could be yeah. more true. That's, that's a great point. And I, I think that's a good place for us to, to wrap up. It's that culture is key throughout all of this. Um, so uh, that is the, the time that we have for today. So I wanna thank folks that uh, attended the discussion. Um, so I do wanna share our contact information in case you wanna follow up with any of the panelists. Uh, Michael, Spencer, myself are all on there. Uh, so Michael, Spencer, I want to thank both of you for, for taking the time. And uh, this was a really fun conversation and certainly eye-opening for me. Uh, for those of you that uh, attended or watching the recording, thank you all for taking the time to tune in. Uh, and uh, we'll catch you at the next one. Thank you all so much. And have a great rest of the day. We'll be seeing Thanks, you. Thanks, Max. Thanks, thank Spencer. You, Max. Thank you, Michael.